I guess I want to ask about the uh, nature of desire. Um, is meditation enough, like, to get over desires? I mean, you know, like, I know I have desires, but is it just, like, regular practice that slowly, it, eventually, you lose all of them by doing this every day? No. No. In fact, when you start practicing meditation, you might notice that desires actually get stronger. You know them much better than before. You can articulate them more accurately. You even know your priorities better. So... Instead of desires controlling you, you can end up controlling your desires. And that is the pattern shift we are looking for. As long as we are in this human body, we have desires, even if it's the basic kind of biological desire for food and sleep and drink, whatever. But we have much higher desires, emotional, cognitive, related to pride, procreation, whatever drives you forward and we can and we should prevent desires from becoming greed or disdain becoming anger what is really important to see that desire and anger are the two sides of the same coin we call that willpower or energy between a and b you want to accomplish something if it's a desired type of accomplishment it's uh, creative, results in multiplication, results in new appearances. If it's an anger type of accomplishment, then it results in destruction, results in forced disappearance of humans and other forms. What is really important that we keep our minds before these dualities, then we can make our choice. And this choice is not for ourselves primarily it's for all beings around us like if you're a father and you have three sons and those sons are really misbehaving you have to pretend to be very upset but inside you have love for them they are your sons but you have to be sometimes very firm even raise your voice if necessary the outside world can interpret this as anger no, you're not angry. You're strong. Because you have to break through the little walls of ego to drive the message home. So, as long as we have this body and we have this kind of soul, we have desire and anger, but we should look at the root. The root is dualistic views. If you identify with these dualistic views, they become ignorance. If you don't identify with them, but create them or remove them selflessly in order to help other beings, then it becomes your fuel. It becomes your raw material. So use that correctly. And meditation actually helps you attain the mind before any dualities. The mind of oneness, the mind of clarity. And out of that oneness and clarity, you can exercise freedom and responsibility at the same time. We barely have the two together. Usually the West wants unfettered freedom. And we are very grudgingly, slowly uh, assuming responsibility, only when we really have to. How about looking at this package of freedom as responsibility built in? Or vice versa, if you take responsibility, you also have the freedom ultimately. I mean, have you ever had a dog? You have to assume responsibility for that dog, walk the dog, feed the dog, clean up after the dog, train the dog, whatever. So it's a big responsibility, but, <clears throat> but then you have the mastery over the dog. You have the freedom to call the dog your own, and ultimately the dog loves you and obeys you because you took responsibility and became his or her master and owner. So this is going hand in hand. These two are inseparable. If you want to have one, removed from the other, it cannot last too long. The other 
missing part appears naturally and necessarily. So be careful with desires, but don't think you can live without them. If your mind is clear, you control desire. If your mind is not clear, desire controls you. Yeah, uh, a technical question. Uh, first, like it doesn't make me feel like a loser to know that knee pains are a part of this, but to what level do you push through the pain when you're going through a 50 minute meditation? At what point, like, you know, do Don't you lose? Don't fight physical pain. Raise your leg. Uh -huh. That's why we teach that. This is not the how do I torture myself school. <laughs> you deal with the body as you have to deal with the body. The, the body is way slower than the mind. Deal with the mind. And then do the three very important things. Stretch, walk, drink, water or tea. So if you stretch enough, it gives you enough flexibility. If you walk, it purges your body of the toxic waste that is actually released during meditation. And drinking uh, does the same thing. It purifies the body and rehydrates you. And then within a few days, the physical pain is largely gone. I'm very sorry to say, but the weekend retreat is not really enough to experience all the blessings of meditation. A longer effort may be necessary. In a 90-day retreat, it takes about one week to really get up to cruising altitude. But when you do, then you realize why there's been an enormous effort to preserve this tradition and put it on a path steady into the future. Because this has great value, but also the entry level is pretty high. So we try to make it step by step, but we don't make it easy. There is no easy or difficult, but you may have a stiff body or a loose body, more flexible or less. But we are barely done with the retreat when the pain would start to ease. Okay. And ultimately you, you realize that as you get older, the body will be less and less suitable for extended meditation practice. And while we are young, we have to use our time. It's very rare you would see 70, 75 year old monks meditating. Some do, but they started when they were 25, 28. In that way you can. And eventually you feel the pain of the mind, which hasn't finished the job. And that's way bigger pain than the body can any time inflict upon yourself. When you feel that you could have done a much better job as a human being, becoming more aware, more enlightened, more compassionate, wiser, more selfless, it was right in front of you, but you haven't used the opportunity. And you knew it. And you said, no, I want to deal with something else. And as we get closer to departure from this body, we realize that whatever they put on our dead body, it will have no pockets. We cannot take anything from here with us, but we take our karma. We take our identity. That's what defines us next lifetime. Is this what we want to take with us? And remember, this is not a place for guilt. It's a place for insight. See it for yourself. And feel that big pain inside. I am still like this. Do I want to live and die like this? Then you overcome the pain of the body very quickly, especially if it's technically possible. And it is possible. But no one can take away the pain of the mind that suffers from its own karma. It wants to make a change, but somehow delays it, puts it off, explains it away, procrastinates. That's the greatest pain. And that's why we come back to this moment and we do the right thing. And that puts us to the right direction and we can endure pretty much anything and everything. All right.